Okay, well, uh, it's time to start. <laughs> Um, no, this is not there. Let's see. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yes. Uh, happy four twenty to those who are off celebrating somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. First, so first, an announcement about the first writing assignment. So I just now managed to write uh, questions for it and put them up. The syllabus isn't completely updated yet. Um, and I, I decided to put up the due date till after next weekend. So, because it took me so long to write these questions. Um, so we'll now be due on uh, Tuesday, May 2nd, I think. All right. Um, and yeah, I don't know. They're not the best essay questions I've ever written. It's pretty hard to write essay questions about this material. Um, that is, I think they're good questions, but I'm afraid they might be too hard. <laughs> so uh, like, I don't know, do your best with them. Um, okay. Um, Right, so unless there are questions, I'm going to start talking about Walden. Um, so this book really, it's like in a different class from civil disobedience. I mean, it's a different class from almost every other book ever written. <laughs> um, and therefore, uh, I have to admit that I, you know, although I've been reading it for a long time, and I had an audio book of it, and I used to listen to it over and over again for a while. I still don't understand it very well. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how to introduce it, because Thoreau says about uh, his friend, the woodchopper, you can't introduce him any more than if you wanted to introduce a woodchuck to your neighbor. <laughs> He's got to find him out the same way you did. Um, so, um, and uh, I certainly don't know how to have, like to survey it or like summarize its main themes. For Thoreau was a surveyor, among other things. Right, that's what you have to remember when he talks about surveying something. Um, but yeah, so I guess the, he knew how to survey Walden. Anyway, the pond, if not the book. <laughs> That's one of the things he did while he was there. Um, but uh, but I didn't really know how to do that. Um, on the other hand, I wouldn't feel right teaching a book, a class about American philosophy without including this. In fact, I kind of vaguely considered doing the whole course just about this. <laughs> um, uh, but um, obviously, I I uh, gave up that plan pretty quickly. But um, um, and I guess you know, so it is definitely about Thoreau's individual experience or experiment, as he sometimes says. Right, like an ex experiment should, I guess, kind of mean what you, what happens to you when you have experience. <laughs> um, you know, so although Thoreau is thinking about scientific experiments when he says experiment too, right? When he says something like, I don't even remember if this is in the assigned reading, this is gonna be another problem. Since I know this book so well, and we quoting parts and not remember whether they were assigned or not. But, um, that he says so we are we are the subject of an experiment of no little interest to me, <laughs> right? So I mean, it it means yeah, like an experiment is being done on us or something like that. But it also means we're like the subject of experience. <laughs> um, so uh, 
anyway, you know, and um, as he says at the very beginning, so um, I'm be reading from this edition that I have, but I wrote the page numbers from the Dover edition in the margin, so I should be able to. So in the Dover edition, this is wait, what? Right. This is a this is on page one of the misquick end of the Dover edition. Um says uh we commonly do not remember that it is, after all, always the first person that is speaking. Right? So, like everything he's saying is about his own experiment or experience. Um, and it's also true that this book is about like everything and everyone, you know, like the universal will or whatever. Um, However, um, well, and so, yeah, okay, sorry. Here's a quote about that. This is on page 215 in mine. Page 208 in the, in the concluding chapter. England and France, Spain and Portugal, Gold Coast and Slave Coast, all front on this private sea. But no bark from them has, has ventured out of sight of land, though it is without doubt the direct way to India. <laughs> so, right, meaning that, like, um, when you or when Thoreau talks about his own experience, he's talking about the sea on which all the countries of the world want. They all have a coast <laughs> on the same sea. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, it's also about America. Um, and sometimes at least more particularly about New England as opposed to any other particular place, right? And he says that also very near the beginning. Um, so wait, this is, on page, this is on page two in the Dover edition. Do people want me to keep saying the page number? You're not writing it down or anything, or do you want me to? Look at that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll keep saying it then. All right, so this is on page two in the Dover edition. I would fain say something, not so much concerning the Chinese and the Sandwich Islanders, as you who read these pages, who are said to live in New England. Um. Something about your condition, especially your outward condition or circumstances in this world. So, I mean, as with every almost every other sentence, there's a lot of things you could say about that, right? Like, I mean, one that's kind of near the surface is you are said to live in New England. Like, are you really living or are you just said to live? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the things it means. Also, like, are said to live in New England. Um, that is, it's said to be new. Um, but it also does mean that he's not talking about the Chinese or the Hawaiians, right? The Sandwich Islanders. He's talking about the inhabitants of New England. Um, it's also true that the book is about something else that he calls the only true America, right? So I'm going to try to get back to that, what that is. But okay, let me start with that thing about sandwich, not about the Chinese and 
and the Hawaiians, but rather about you who are said to live in New England. So, I mean, why would you even think this book might be about the Chinese or the Sandwich Islands? Right? Like, why is he, why is that what he's telling you it's not about? Well, so the answer is that, among other things, it's a travel book. Because here's the next sentence. I have traveled a good deal in Concord. <laughs> That's how it starts, right? So, like, um, and as he said, even before that, he's, you know, um, um, he wants to make this the kind of report he would send to uh, relatives in a distant land, <laughs> right? So this is, it's like a record of his, his travel <laughs> around Concord and then out of Concord to the woods and then back to Concord. Um, and um, what that means is that like, he finds his native place foreign, right? Like he's there, he's traveling around it um, or living right near it. And yet he finds himself writing a travel book about it. Um, I get, I mean, I guess these travel books were a bigger deal in the 19th century than they are now, I guess. But we still kind of have travel books, but you know, I guess when it was harder to travel, <laughs> Like if you went to, you know, if someone from New England went to India and traveled around India, they would come home and write a book about their experience, right? So that, that, that's, that's what this is like, only his experience was in Congress. <laughs> um, uh, so um, he finds his native place foreign. Um, He talks about this again in uh, the chapter on the village. So this is page 111 in the Dover edition. Um, Often in a snowstorm, even by day, one will come out upon a well-known road and yet find it impossible to tell which way leads to the village. Though he knows that he has traveled it a thousand times, he cannot recognize a feature in it, but it is as strange to him as if it were a road in Siberia. Um, and then going down a little bit, um, in our most trivial walks, we are constantly, though unconsciously, steering like pilots by certain well-known beacons and headlands. And if we go beyond our usual course, we still carry in our minds the bearing of some neighboring cape. And not till we are completely lost or turned around. For a man needs only to be turned around once with his eyes shut in this world to be lost. Do we appreciate the vastness, vastness and strangeness of nature? Right, so the... the um, Um, the kind of turning around that he's done has made him uh, a foreign traveler in his native place. Um, so this is a kind of... Um, I guess you could say like a secularized version of version of conversion. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if if secularized is the right word for it at all. I mean, presumably it's not the right word for it at all. I mean, part of what he's doing here is like turning away from you know, the, the cyclone is, so like, I mean, this can, this, 
like originally means age, like an age of the world, you know, like that iron age or whatever. Um, so uh, then it got used to mean world. I'm not sure if that was completely, if that was an internal Latin thing or was just due to translation from Hebrew. I'm not sure actually. I should know that, but I don't. But in any case, right? So like, I mean, he's not, he's, he's turning away from this. He's turning away from the age that he finds himself in. So I guess like to call it a secularized conversion would be wrong, but it's, um, but it is at least taken out of its particularly Christian context. Um, I mean, it's, If you if you don't believe that that's what's going on, I just need to read a little bit more on that page, I guess. So this is still on page 111. Um, not till we are lost. In other words, not till we have lost the world do we begin to find ourselves. Right? That's an allusion to... Um, uh, Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? <laughs> yeah. Um, did he feel like a foreigner in Concord? Because like in this time, uh, people were more, like already trained and like stuff. And then like when he would go to the woods, it was like completely opposite of that. Well, I, I mean, well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you mean by already, I mean, yeah, people have always been in that, right? <laughs> I guess, but yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's something he talks about a lot. I mean, he talks about it from different weird points of view, right? Like sometimes he says, I have my trade too. I have my business. I think it's important to have good business habits, <laughs> right? Um, but other times, I think this wasn't part of the assigned reading, but where he says that uh, he, um, when he was trying to come up with a way to make a living, he had first thought that uh, he might gather huckleberries and sell them, <laughs> and then and he thought that he thought that would be most like the that would be the thing most like the professions that his friends were going into <laughs> that he could do. And then he said, but I have since learned that um, the curse of trade attaches to everything it touches. It's, I'm not remembering the exact right words, right? So like, um, yeah, something like that is, or I mean, at least that's, that's one of the ways he expresses what's what's strange, what's foreign about it. And I mean, including right in that place at the beginning, because right, what he says after he says he, how much he's traveled around Concord is that everywhere he went, he found people doing remarkable penance. <laughs> they, so what, what are they doing? I mean, they're, you know, they're just working to make a living. And yet he says that, um, um, it's more foreign to him than these acts of penance he reads about the Brahmins doing in India. Um, um, So after having traveled around Concord, he like goes home to the woods to write his account. <laughs> right? He says, um, to the woods where I was better known. <laughs> um, now there's something about wood, the woods. So this is something, um, 
It, I mentioned my teacher, Stanley Cavell, again. I feel a little weird about mentioning him when I lecture about Emerson and Thoreau. Well, actually, I've never lectured about Thoreau before this. <laughs> uh, and I was a little scared to, to do it. Although, like I said, I also considered making a whole course about it. <laughs> um, but anyway, like I feel weird mentioning Cavell when I lecture about Emerson or Thoreau because uh, I doubt he would like what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, um, he wasn't necessarily that patient, and 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 moreover, if we disagree, he's probably right. <laughs> but in any case, this is something that that I can't help mentioning because there's so many things I never would have noticed if he hadn't pointed them out. So one is that um, how would Thoreau have pronounced this? Well, he had a New England accent, presumably. So it was like words. <laughs> right. I mean, they basically sound the same. <laughs> so this is like a pun for him. <laughs> um, so when he, I mean, of course, he did go live in the woods, right? I mean, it's not like just a symbol or something. He actually did go live in the woods. But when he says, you know, I re I went. Oh, took back to the woods where I was better known. You could also read, I went back to the words where I was better known. And this also, I mean, I know I heard Cavell apply this to the subtitle of Walden. Right? So the subtitle of Walden is Life in the Woods. And if you, uh, if you think of Walden as the book rather than the pond, then you can change this to life and the words. The only problem with this is that Thoreau actually deleted the subtitle in his copy. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know why, but he like crossed it out. <laughs> um, so like in this, um, the, the Dover edition basically follows the first edition. Whereas in this Norton critical edition, they didn't print the subtitle except in their apparatus in the back because they said, well, Thoreau didn't want it. I don't know. Anyway, be that as it may, so he's he's like, he's gone home. Um, he Well, he goes home to the woods or to the words where he's better known to write his account. And now he's off on new travels again. Right. He said, he said at present, I am a sojourner in civilized life again. A sojourner is someone who's not there to stay, but just like traveling through. Um, so from this point of view, and now, so I guess I should have said, so what am I going to do instead of trying to summarize the whole book and what's going on, which I think is impossible, at least for me. Um, I'm just, I'm going to try to focus on something on like at least one thread that kind of connects with other things that are happening in this course. So, um, so that's what I'm moving towards here. And what I wanted to say was that from this point of view, it's maybe not surprising that the fullest treatments of other people in the book are two other foreigners. Um, so first of all, there's this Canadian woodshop. Um, so uh, Thoreau, um, Thoreau says, I'm sorry, I can't print his name here because it's so suitable and, and poetic. Now, I mean, why can't he print his name? Well, uh, so I read a whole article about this once. There, in the 19th century, there were like elaborate rules about when, you, when and how you were allowed to print the names of living people. Um, I mean, they, they were not, we're not talking about laws here, we're talking about like etiquette, you know, but they were like well known rules. And um, um, so, like, one thing that's happening here is that Thoreau is following those rules. I mean, 
I guess we know the rule well enough to know that if, if you thought the rules were really bad, you wouldn't follow them, right? I mean, uh, but he does follow them pretty much in this book, right? So that's also why, you know, when he, he says something about uh, um, people who are so afraid of danger that they, you would think they would always chose the safest place where Dr. B might be present at a moment's notice, right? So it's like Dr. B, because it's a it's an actual person and he can't print his name. <laughs> Presumably his I, my third. Um, doctors of other genders in the role in the conquered <laughs> right. So anyway, um, um so however we know the name of the Canadian Woodchuck. Um and His name was, this is a catch, Alec Carrion. <laughs> um, so uh, um, that's one of the people he spends the longest time describing in the book. And the other is this Irish laborer, John Field. Now, I mean, sometimes people think, and I actually used to think this until this summer, <laughs> that John Field must be a pseudonym. Again, because like you shouldn't, you wouldn't want to print his real name. But it turns out that no, he did print his real name. <laughs> Perhaps because a court Irishmen, like, you know, were, like I said, these rules were complicated. They basically had to do with social status. And perhaps Irishmen weren't entitled to this. So, um, I mean, you can't, you could draw a negative conclusion about the road from this. And, um, I'm not sure what I think about it. Oh, about the whole issue about what was his attitude towards Irishmen. I mean, right, like, I hope you understand that in this period, Irishmen were um, um, there was, like, ethnic prejudice against them, right? So um, um, it seems like Thoreau is at least playing into that that he does. But so in any case, John Field is actually a real person because we know because there's uh, 18 from the 1850 census, there's records <laughs> of him and his wife, Mary, and their children. By 1850, they were living in Lincoln, which is the village right next, to, you know, the next one on that Thoreau sometimes mentions. Um, so, uh, um, by the way, and this might be another reason why he thinks he can print his name. So he, he says, you know, one of the last things he says about John Field, he says, poor John Field, I trust he does not read this. Well, according to the census records, John Field was illiterate. <laughs> so he couldn't have read it. His children, though, the census, they had, you know, they didn't ask a lot of questions in those days, but they did ask whether they did try to keep track of how many adults were illiterate in a household and also whether the children had been to school in the past year. And all the children were in school. <laughs> but John and his wife, Mary, were illiterate. Well, okay, so in any case, um, why would, I mean, you might think that this was a pseudonym because, uh, because this is a suitable poetic name, right? <laughs> I mean, like, the whole, you know, the whole, the whole story of John Field is we've kind of been like plowed into the field. <laughs> as Thoreau sometimes puts it. Um, as for Alex Tarion, why is this such a um, suitable and poetic name? Well, there's actually two reasons. So one is that um, there's a French word. I didn't really know French. I know 
quite a few languages poorly, but French not really. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know, nevertheless, I was able to determine there's a French word which is pronounced exactly the same way, terrain, which means like it's it's basically the equivalent of the English word terra. You know, like like uh, someone from Earth. <laughs> Or like earthling. That's what it means. So Alex Tarion is kind of like terrestrial. Um, this is probably, I'm thinking this is what Thoreau mostly has in mind. However, I've seen it suggested, and maybe he also has this in mind because it's also related to what he says about this fellow uh, that this Greek word, which is not pronounced the same way at all, right? It's, well, we pronounce it Therion, um, means beast. Um, right, that is like animal, non human animal. Um, so again, maybe Thoreau is also thinking about that. that or maybe that's what makes it especially poetic and suitable is that it has both of these meanings. <laughs> um, so, um, So of these two, um, I'm going to talk about Field first. So he's from Europe. Now, I mean, I think, uh, as I was saying, I mean, it's what Thoreau is doing with anti-Irish prejudice is probably complicated. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it's nice. <laughs> I, um, I mean, Thoreau doesn't claim to be nice. Um, uh, but, um, but nevertheless, it's at least I could say it's complicated. I mean, I think the point is, like, we know, um, uh, like Emerson, he, um, the contrast between America and Europe means something. Um, and in particular, like, another thing that makes him feel foreign in Concord is, that uh, remember what I said about those of you who are set to live in New England. You're said to live somewhere new, but you're not. <laughs> you're still living in the old country. So, I mean, so as a representative of Europe come to America, he doesn't choose an Englishman, right, or a, a, a Frenchman, which would, um, which the people of Concord look up to, <laughs> right? So instead, as like an example of Europe, someone who is, like attempted to settle in America, but hasn't managed to settle. And it's still really back in Europe. He chooses an Irishman because um, then like his Yankee readers can um, um, appreciate their own foreignness, I think is, is what he's trying to do. Um, I mean, anyway, this is one of the, this is the, I, um, 
I, I guess in some ways, one of the harshest things that he says about John Field, this is on page one, uh, let's see, no, page 140 in Latin. It's in page, it's the bottom of page 135 in the Dover edition. Poor John Field, I trust he does not read this unless he will improve by it. Thinking to live by some, unless he will improve by it. Like I said, John Field isn't really going to read it, but someone else is going to read it. Maybe they'll improve by it. Thinking to live by some derivative old country mode in this primitive new country, to catch perch with shiners. So, I mean, apparently it's true that so this is, as, as I think I said last time, this is what's uh, maybe not the only thing, but it's one thing that's really difficult about this book. That you you catch things that seem really significant, but then then Thoreau goes back to like talking about what's the bait, best bait for catching perch, and you're not sure what to do with that. Like, is it should you look deeper and try to figure out what shiners symbolize or something like that? Um, uh, or should you just like read through that until you get to the next thing that you can understand? So this is another thing. I mentioned this to Stanley Cavell, something about this once, and he said, oh, you mean the smooth re reflecting surface, right? Well, then the pond has a smooth reflecting surface. You can't see what's going on in it. And um, although I think this next thing I'm going to say, Cavell maybe doesn't didn't like because he has a different interpretation of the loon. But there's a chapter where he's chasing this loon around Walden in his boat. You know, a loon is, is like a bird. But yeah. So it's it's a bird, but it's a bird that can dive and swim a long distance underwater. So he's chasing the loon around Waldman and his boat. And every time he gets close to it, the loon dives under the smooth reflecting surface. And then he tries to guess where it will come up next. And uh, he always guesses wrong, basically, right? So like, or usually, you know, so he'll, he'll row off in one direction and, and, and then he'll hear the loon laughing at him behind him, like the loon surface somewhere else. So, like, um, that's, I, I think one of the things that is about is about the experience of reading this book, right? Like Thoreau <laughs> is kind of laughing at you because he dives beneath this smooth reflecting surface and you can't, you can't see where the thought continues with it. Because it just reflects you back to yourself. Um, as Kierkegaard says somewhere, if an ape looks in, no apostle can look out. <laughs> yeah. Is it fun to talk about last night's on that explicitly stating or what you're trying to say? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, and but he says, like, um, I mean, it's 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 smooth. It's so smooth and reflecting that this book can be assigned to high school students, right? And like people can just read it and, and get something out of it, right? Like I mean, you couldn't do that with Kierkegaard. I mean, or at least you shouldn't. <laughs> I you know I, you certainly shouldn't do it with Nisha. You know what what will come of that? <laughs> Um, uh, but this, it's got this like, yeah, harmless, smooth, reflecting surface. And yet, once you start trying to chase Thoreau around, you realize that he's under the surface. And every once in a while, you catch him coming up and laughing at you. But he can't, you don't know how he got there or where he's going to be next. <laughs> so, um, right. So that was all digression about to, to say that, like, I don't understand exactly what the point is about. So, like, I don't know anything about fishing, <laughs> um, but 
uh, fortunately, you know, now we have the internet and uh, I could just Google catch and pitch with perch with shiners. <laughs> I found some website about how to catch perch. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, like it turns out that shiners are not generally, a shine, shiners are small silvery fish of some kind or other. So the, not always the same species, but so some little small silvery fish. And yeah, generally the best bait for perch are worms or minnows. Shiners are not as good. But like, um, why is that an old country mode? So as far as I can tell, uh, people fish for perch in Ireland now the same way they do here. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was different then or if there's some other reason we're supposed to be able to see this as an old country mode. In any case, the point is, like, whatever the details of that problem with catching, trying to catch perch with shires are, um, he does think that that's what his Yankee townsmen are also doing. They're trying to catch something using a derivative old country mode and it's getting away from them. And presumably it's also what he thinks that um, Yankee, his Yankee philosophical compatriots are doing. I mean, maybe not Emerson, but um, but others who he's thinking of. Um, this is, oh, I didn't write your page numbers in the margin here, but this is, uh, well, we'll never find it. It's somewhere near the middle of, of the long chapter on economy. Um, I guess it's not, it's, it's close to the beginning of the assigned reading in the chapter on economy. As I preferred some things to others and especially valued my freedom, as I could fare hard and yet succeed well, I did not wish to spend my time in earning rich carpets or other fine furniture or delicate cookery or a house in the Grecian or the Gothic style just yet. Right, so you know, here in my helpful critical edition, there's a footnote for Grecian or the Gothic style. Architectural styles popular in the 19th century, revivals of classical Greek and medieval European architecture, respectively. Okay, but you know, Grecian or the Gothic style, you should think of like Greece and Germany. as like styles of philosophy that people he knows look up to, I think. Um, and he doesn't, he, he says, I'm, I'm not interested in building a house in the Greek or Gothic style. I think um, that would be a derivative old country mode. You won't be able to catch perch that way. So, um, so that's what John Field, I mean, or at least that's part of what John Field represents. That's, that's the part of what he's doing with John Field that has some relevance to this course. <laughs> his, um, <clears throat> his, his analysis of John Field is, has something to do with um, the way America is not sufficiently independent. And the, you know, what we think of as independence didn't do it. Um, and it's in the context of talking about John Field that he says that thing about the only true America. Um,
This is on uh, page 133 in the Dover edition. So he's talking about how the reason John Field has to work so hard is because he wants to get fresh meat and coffee and tea and butter every day for his family. Um, which sounds reasonable enough. <laughs> but this is his, his criticism of it. Um, When he had worked so, when he had worked hard, he had to eat hard again to repair the waste of his system. And so it was as broad as it was long. Indeed, it was broader than it was long, for he was discontented and wasted his life into the bargain. And yet he had rated it as a gain in coming to America that here you could get tea and coffee and meat every day. But the only true America is that country where you are at liberty to pursue such a mode of life as may enable you to do without these, and where the state does not endeavor to compel you to sustain the slavery and war and other superfluous expenses, which directly or indirectly result from the use of such things. Right, so the place, the true America where we're trying to settle. <laughs> um, but, um, in which everyone who is set to live in New England is still foreign, is the place where um, this, you know, you wouldn't use these things that would require slavery and war. Um, I mean, there's there's two things to say about that. One is that this seems to be to me to be an allusion to Plato's Republic. Um, so didn't I just say he didn't want to build a house on the Grecian side? <laughs> Um, well, um, in, not a Platonist. Emerson is much closer to being some kind of Platonist. Um, um, but he does know really well what Plato says. And he's going to use it for his purposes if he wants to. Um, and sometimes he may attribute it to an Indian philosopher. <laughs> um, in this case, I think it's, you know, the illusion is it's slight, it's, or it's Slight. It's uh, underplayed. Like, like you really. I mean, you really would have to. Um, you really have to be paying attention to see it. <laughs> In other places, there's there's places where um, he, in effect, wants to quote something that it says in Plato, and yet he um, he manages to quote the same thing from Confucius, for example. Right? Like, so Confucius said, to know what we know and what we do not know, that is true knowledge. Right? Well, I mean, that's a definition of philosophy from the... Um, sorry, I like that um, Carmides? Anyway, so some dialogue like that. Um, right, but but Thoreau quotes it from Confucius instead. 
I mean, I'm not saying that Confucius didn't also say it, but the point is, like, um, if he has a choice, he'll quote it from uh, exotic sources. Um, because, like, um, whatever is true in Plato is exotic for the people he's writing to. So anyway, what's the allusion to Plato's Republic? Well, it, you know, um, at the near the beginning of the Republic, there's this thing. So there's when Socrates first starts talking about what the best city would be. He says, "Well, we would live under oaks and eat acorns and sing hymns to the gods and." Uh, um, he, right, he portrays this very, it's not really a city at all, right? He portrays a bunch of people living in the woods and not uh, really being civilized. <laughs> and uh, I always forget, I think it's Glaucon who says, um, but that's a city for, for pigs. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and Socrates says, oh, like, you mean you wanted stuff like pickle relishes and dancing girls and flutes and whatever? And Bob kind of says, Yeah, I want a civilized city. And Cyrus says, Oh, okay. I thought you were asking about the healthy city, but if you want to know about the fevered city, well, okay, so in that case, we're going to need to control territory. So we're going to need to fight wars. So we're going to need the soldier class and then blah, blah, blah. And from that, the whole thing that people usually call the Republic gets developed, <laughs> right? So I think um, Thoreau is, I mean, how Thoreau understands the Republic, I'm not sure. It's, um, uh, but so, I mean, depending on how he understands it, he's either agreeing with Socrates or disagreeing with Socrates, <laughs> right? It's like, do we think, so, so a lot of times people call that first city the city of pigs, but Socrates calls it the healthy city. <laughs> right, so like, do we think that Socrates all along really thought that was the best city? Um, so I don't know, one way or the other, anyway, Thoreau is um, um, yes, in some ways it works better if you think he's disagreeing with Plato and saying that John Field um, has, well, I don't know if agreeing or just, John Field has taken the wrong moral from reading the Republic. That's another old country mode that he's adopted. Now, I mean, like, does that make sense? Did John Field read the Republic? No, he was illiterate. But um, um, um The next sentence after what I read is, for I purposely talked to him as if he were a philosopher or desired to be one. <laughs> right? So, like, he's talking to John Field as if John Field had just been reading The Republic. And he's saying, um, uh, no, pay attention to what happens right there. If you didn't want those things, you wouldn't need war and slavery. And He's also saying to his readers, sure enough, you've all made this wrong choice. And that's why we have, in fact, have war and slavery. Um, okay, so um, that's what I wanted to say about John Field. Now I want to talk about all uh, um, by the way, I guess some people have suggested, so um, it's 
not clear that Thoreau ever had relationships with women. This is, it seems like not. Um, uh, it's been suggested that, that Alex Carignan was like a romantic interest of his. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's difficult to, to know anything like that. But he's certainly someone who he's very, in some way, very taken with. Um, and he's from, so John Field is from Europe. But carry on from where? Canada. So, like, Canada is the new world, but it's outside our borders. And um, um, and as I think I've already said before in this course, but at least from the point of view of America, but maybe also from the point of view of Canada, or at least English Canada, as they say, um, that's kind of, uh, that's related to like kind of paradox about it. Or, but also the 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 fact that we always forget about it, um, right? So there's like this funny line in The Simpsons. They think they still have The Simpsons, don't they? I haven't seen it for like decades, but it's still going on. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, in this, uh, someone is giving a speech about you know like I don't know how he's from an immigrant family and whatever, and he says, where else but in America? Well, possibly Canada. <laughs> like that's, that's what I, it's, uh, it's like a weird afterthought kind of. Well, so, um, I think uh, Thoreau is, thinking about Canada that way. I mean, I think he's using it for that. So what is it? It's kind of like, it's the, it's like the specific not here of America. The kind of necessary not here of America. Because we need it for that. This, um, going back to the final chapter, um, um, oh, yeah, just the second sentence of the chapter. It's on page 206, the Dover edition. Thank heaven, here is not all the world. The buckeye does not grow in New England, and the mockingbird is rarely heard here. The wild goose is more of a cosmopolite than we. He breaks his fast in Canada, takes a luncheon in the Ohio, and plumes himself for the night in the southern bayou. Right? Canada is this, the, the goose, the wild goose is able to be more of a cosmopolite, right? Like a citizen of the world than we, because like, you know, we're stuck here, but the wild goose can have breakfast in Canada. Um, well, I mean, maybe you think that reading is not so strong, um, but, Here's another thing that Terry out when he's first introduced. This is on page 93 in the Dover edition. Beside, there were wafted to me evidences of unexplored and uncultivated continents on the other side. Ray, like he's from the other side. The other side of what? Well, it's just like the other side of nothing, just the other side of, of this border. 
there isn't anything on the, I mean, there, it doesn't have sides. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just an arbitrary border. So, um, So of course, I mean, this is what I'm saying about Canada. It's like, I have to say, it's a little worrying, it's a little worrying because as I think I mentioned before, Canada in um, 1848 uh, or in 1853 or whatever, uh, whatever year we should use here, wasn't really exactly like Canada is now. Um, so, uh, I mean, um, it was, I mean, the, the country that we call Canada didn't really exist until 1867, the Confederate Act of Confederation. Um, this is the this is this is a very very short course on Canadian history, <laughs> right? So prior to 1867, so what happened in 1867 is that there were three British provinces. One of them was called the Province of Canada, and the other two were New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And as part of this um, deal they reached, and like it had to be negotiated between the colonists, but also with Parliament in England, right? But part of the deal they reached was that Canada would be split into two parts, Ontario and Quebec. And then all four of these provinces would join together into a new entity called the Dominion of Canada. So that was the original uh, Dominion of Canada. Then, you know, like Manitoba joined later, British Columbia. Um, uh, British Columbia actually almost didn't join Canada. Like there were a lot of people who there wanted to join the United States instead. <laughs> and they had to promise part of the deal to get British Columbia to join was to promise to build a Trans Canada Railroad. I don't know what this big picture helps. <laughs> anyway, well, I mean, I guess it does help with this because it's like one of the continuing themes of Canada is that of Canadian history is that it like. It almost it's almost always easier to go this direction than to go across Canada. There's like all these natural barriers. So, you know, like naturally, if you wanted to send stuff from British Columbia to Ontario, you would you would go this way. But because of the border, because it's Canada, they they built their own transcontinental railroad. That was and that was part of how they got British Columbia to join. Anyway, sorry, that's a real digression. Obviously, that has nothing to do with the road. That happened in like 1871. Um, but um, so before this, um, how did they get to that configuration where there was a province called Canada? So go earlier, before 1840. There were two provinces called Upper Canada and Lower Canada. And Upper Canada was basically what would later be Ontario, and Lower Canada was basically what would later be Quebec. Um, so that actually the union of those two was part of an earlier reform. And it happened because there was actually there were rebellions in Canada in 1837, the rebellions of 1837 in both Upper Canada and Lower Canada. So they were put down by the British military, but then they sent uh, 
Lord Durham, <laughs> uh, from England to investigate and find out, uh, like make recommendations. And he came back and he said, well, first of all, um, we, should, we should join those two provinces. And second of all, they should be given responsible government. So responsible government basically means, um, so this is the way there's responsible government in England. Um, the government uh, is appointed by the queen, but they have to pass, uh, they have to, you know, like have a majority in parliament, right? Like parliament can remove them. So the queen always has to basically has to appoint the government that parliament approves of. Right, so um, so saying that they should be given re responsible government meant that the government of Canada should be um, responsible to the voters in Canada, just the way the government in England is responsible for the voters in England, even though technically the Queen is still was still really ruling Canada through her Governor General. Um, after and this was completed in 1849. So after 1849, Canada was basically independent. But it was still a province of the British Empire. <laughs> all right. So anyway, what does all this have to do with Thoreau? I mean, um, uh, I think, you know, it shows that although Thoreau and the example of Alec Tarian is a you know is a perfect example. Well, Thoreau basically still thinks of Canada as mostly French Canada. Um, English Canada actually does exist in the 1840s, and um, as opposed to right, I re remember I said that when we think about Canada in the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, Upper Canada basically didn't exist yet. I found out when Toronto was founded in 1793. So, um, so anyway, um, so like at least um, it it exists and it's it's reasonable to think that Thoreau sees it as a like already as kind of a place that will be just like America only over this border. Um, right, remember Walton was published in 1853. Well, it says 1854 on the title page. Maybe it's other, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, uh, that's one thing about Canada in, in around 1850. Another thing about Canada around 1850, which uh, uh, this is like the one thing Americans do know about the history of Canada, that of course slavery had been abolished in the British Empire in the 1830s. So there was no slavery except in India. <laughs> That's all of Canada works. But anyway, so there was no slavery in Canada, right? So um, um, so this, this this the situation was that slaves were trying to is it okay if I say slaves or am I supposed to say enslaved people now? Worry about these things, but all right. It does make a difference what you call them. Maybe not always as much of a difference as you think, but it does make a difference. Anyway, uh, so, right, the um, slaves or enslaved people were trying to flee the free country of America in order to get to Canada, which was still seen as under the thumb of the tyrannical British monarchy. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, so 
Uh, I bring this up. There's a there's a line in the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner, which says like no refuge could save the. We only use we only sing the first stanza, right? But the the poem actually has four stanzas. So the third stanza is a line that says no refuge could save the hireling and slave. Um, and this has become very controversial because people think maybe that the hireling refers to the British use of mercenaries, right? Which was very controversial in the uh, Revolutionary War. That was one, that's one of the things listed in the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances. He has hired foreign mercenaries against us, right? But the slaves, so some people say, well, that means it's because the British organized, like, escaped um, slaves into a, a like, fighting unit, and they were fighting on the British side in 1812. Um, and other people say, no, it just means, and I'm inclined to think this, I mean, how can we, we, can, we can't know what Francis Scott Key really meant from. <laughs> Right, but I'm trying to think this is this is more accurate. That slave there means like, as opposed to Americans who are free, that everyone fighting for the British side is they're all slaves, right? Because they're still living under a monarchy. So, um, like, for Thoreau, it's a sign that. The kind of freedoms we have in America, like it needs this limit. Um, um, and this is the this is the thing that comes closest, I think, to, to other things I've been talking about in the course, but I like I don't know exactly how to explain it or how to express it well, but that um this kind of freedom is uh Is a kind of freedom that if we're if we're enabled to um, yeah maybe I, okay maybe I should put it this way so remember like the issue about the Declaration of Independence is these are universal principles shouldn't they apply to everyone and then so. So one way of taking that, therefore, how can they define a particular place? And one way of taking that is to say, well, uh, that's right. And so the revolution isn't over until we've imposed these principles everywhere. Right, and sure enough, as Bentham points out, that one of the first things the Americans did in the revolution was to invade Canada. <laughs> so the people there weren't rebelling. Later in 1837, they rebelled, but <laughs> in 1775, they were not, right? So, um, but, but, and, and one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence is about Canada, right? It says, you know, like, His Majesty has. But it suspended the system of free British laws in a neighboring province. What that means is that that they uh, allowed the residents of Quebec to, to go back to like maintaining a French legal system and also didn't try to interfere with Catholicism there. Right? So like the American rebels were really upset about that. This is like a sign that George III, just like the old bad Charles II, which is like 
is trying to get absolute monarchy and like these foreign French institutions and Catholicism back. Um, and we gotta get out while we can. And then, and then of course the logical conclusion of that is, and we should free those poor people. <laughs> and that's, that's what they tried to do, right? So like, um, the, the other direction, of course, is, and we know from civil disobedience that Thoreau himself would go more in this direction, right? The other direction to go is to say, um, yes, these principles are universal, and therefore, therefore every individual that should declare independence. And everyone has to do it for themselves. But what about the real situation? It seems like Thoreau is saying that this, this arbitrary limit to, um, to the, the country that's supposedly based on universal principles um, is the only thing that like preserves some kind of freedom. Right, so like the 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 particularity, um, if we were ready for it, if we had the government that governs not at all, we wouldn't need it. But as things are, given what the machine is is and what it's designed for, this is like the most important guarantee of our freedom. <laughs> um, Kind of changed my mind somewhat from when I wrote these notes <laughs> this morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, Right, okay. I think I can get back to that train of thought that I had when I wrote the notes. <laughs> um, right, so that first answer I was giving, you know, like, um, first answer I was giving, uh, could be would would be developed as a way of answering what Bentham asked. Two things that Bentham asked. So one thing that Bentham asks is why the colonists rebelled when even they admit that they were not being taxed excessively. Um, so, um, so Bentham basically imagined was responding, well, but we're afraid we might, and, and that's, and, you know, at that point, Bentham comes in and says, well, but, you know, there's always a danger you might under any government, but instead, presumably they would respond, no, we're standing up for Locke's principle, no taxation without recommend representation. And then when Bentham asks, so why did you invade His Majesty's province of Canada? 
they're going to say, well, um, um, this principle applies everywhere. Um, our border is wherever our principle takes us. Um, and, you know, by abolishing the free system of English laws, his, his majesty has made Quebec into our platform. Um, but, um, but Thoreau can use that answer against them because, so if, if that's the answer, then Thoreau can say, okay, well, let's look at this particular society that's actually within this border and see if it lives up to those principles. And if it doesn't, like by your own admission, America is outside this border. Right? Like they said, you know, Bentham says, why are you going over your own border? And they say, well, um, uh, there is no border to our principle, right? Like America is wherever our principle extends, which is everything. But then if we say, look, it turns out that the hiring and the slave <laughs> um, are the people inside this border. And if they have to leave this border in pursuit of freedom, then it turns out that you have the sides of the border reversed. <laughs> this was America. This was America. It turns out this was America, and this was His Majesty's proposition. <laughs> I mean, like, remember, there, that, that's why, uh, why I went through that little Canadian history lesson, right? Remember, at this point, they're basically both independent. I mean, I, I guess, like, uh, you know, Britain ran Canada's foreign policy, you know, much longer after this. But essentially, as far as, far as their internal affairs are concerned, yeah, they're basically both independent. The Canadians have basically got what the American colonists were demanding before the revolution. And they got it, you know, well, there was that rebellion, but they got it without a war. <laughs> I remember there used to be, uh, probably still are these bumpers, bumper stickers that say biodiesel, no war necessary. <laughs> right. So, um, so, uh, it turns out, like, inside the border is where we need war and slavery. Outside the border is where we, we don't need war or slavery. So it turns out that this was America. And this was Canada. And um, and I think, um, Thoreau is thinking about this when he describes the ant battle. Right? Because he keeps, so there's this battle between two different kinds of ants that he sees in his woodpile. And he keeps comparing it to the Battle of Concord in the American Revolution. <laughs> um, and uh, um, 
right? He said it was the, he, there's the big black ants and the smaller red ants. And he calls, he says they're the red Republicans and the black imperialists. <laughs> um, uh, and then he says, this is on page 149. Um, the Dover edition. There was not one hireling there. I have no doubt that it was a principle they fought for, as much as our ancestors, and not to avoid a three penny tax on their tea. Right? I mean, um, Were they really fighting for that principle? That's obviously what the question he's asking when he says that, right? When he says, I have no doubt that the ants were fighting for a matter of principle, just as our ancestors were, not to avoid a three penny tax on the tea. Um, but um, it looks like. So, right, the only true America is where you don't use things like tea and coffee. You don't need the war and slavery um, and other superfluous expenses that result from the use of such things. But uh, it turns out, it looks like what our ancestors really wanted was that tea. Um. So I think this gets back to the question you were asking about, like, what is his, you know, is is he upset by trade and business? I mean, he's he's upset with it because um, He's not upset with it because it's greedy <laughs> or something like that. And he's not even really upset with it because it results in like the oppression of the lower classes or something like that, right? Because remember, John Peel, like he goes to him and speaks to him as if he were a philosopher. And he says, you know, John Peel, if you lived the way I did, you wouldn't have to do all this work. Um, and, you know, similarly, he says about when he talks about people trying to convince him to uh, put more effort into charitable endeavors like philanthropy. So he says, I went, I actually went to several poor people and made them the offer that um, I would uh, maintain them in just as comfortably as I maintain myself. He said they wanted to all turn down the offer and prefer to remain poor. <laughs> right? Like the point is, I mean, he, he doesn't really blame the oppression of the poor on the rich. He really blames it on, on the poor. Not right, not because they're lazy. It's the opposite, it's because they're they're not lazy enough. <laughs> Right? If they were only lazy like the Romans, they would be fine. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I don't know as a matter of economics or something whether this is a reasonable thing to say. I, I think not, right? I mean, you know, I mean, it's not really true that everyone, even in 1850, I don't think it was true that everyone in New England could suddenly live the way Thoreau was living. You know, like there wasn't enough land for that. And, and besides Thoreau, you know, as is famous and as he hints at in the book, right? He says, when he's accounting for all his expenses, he says like laundry and mending were done outside the house and their bill is yet to be received or something like that. It's because his, his mother did his laundry. <laughs> well, he would say, well, um, so, like, uh, um, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I doubt it's, is it serious? I mean, remember, the, the title of that chapter is Economy. And he even mentions Adam Smith. 
<laughs> in the chat. Um, and yet, um, I mean, economy. So, like Aristotle says that there's there's three branches of practical philosophy: ethics, economics, and politics. So, ethics basically is about like you know individuals, virtues and vices of individuals. Politics, as we know, is about well about the polis, right? Or more generally speaking, about political society, and in between them is economics. And economics, I mean, it comes from the Greek word oikos, which means house. Economics is about like running a household. Um, so, um, I mean, so of course, one thing Thoreau is doing with the title of that chapter is that most of the chapter is about how he built his house, <laughs> right? So it's uh, like, uh, this part means legislation, right? Like house legislation. <laughs> so, you know, he's, uh, the, the, it's about the, like the constitution of his house. <laughs> uh, but also, I think, you know, like his position on what already in his time people mostly meant by economy. At first, they called it political economy, right? Political economy meant the study of running a political society as if it were a household. Um, but that pretty quickly got shortened to economy. So, like, but his position on what you usually mean by economy was that everyone should mind their own business, <laughs> right? So he's not gonna, you know, like as he says, when reformers come to visit them, he knew lots of reformers. When reformers come to visit them, he says they think that he's singing, "This is the house that I built. This is the man that lives in the house that I built." But they don't realize that the third line is, these are the people that worry the man that lives in the house that I built. <laughs> right? Like they're just an annoyance. Get it, get away from you. Right. So so anyway, like I mean, that is, I don't think he's trying to propose an actual solution to um, to poverty, but is a, is a, yeah, that's that, that's not the main reason he, he he's that's not the main thing that bothers him about trade. What bothers him is that um, it's a good way of getting all the things that we don't really need. <laughs> it's good for that. Right, it's like free trade works really well, and that's what he, and he says that about it in some places. In fact, he says that that there's something cheerful and natural about it because of that. Um, um, but uh, but unfortunately, it's like it's a really good machine for getting the things that we don't need, and that we work in the end will require war and slavery. But yeah, um, how, how did I get off on to that? Ooh, I'm almost out of time. What else was I going to say? Oh, so, okay, so there's one more thing I want to say about this, which is about the, the thing about the runaway slaves, where he actually mentions that. Um, this is in the chapter on visitors. It's uh, around page 98. It starts at the bottom of page 98. Um, well, actually, maybe, no, top of page 99. He's talking about all the kinds of 
guests he had who weren't, or visitors who weren't really guests. They were really um, objects of charity. They were coming to ask for help, but they were um, who earnestly wished to be helped and prefaced their appeal with the information that they are resolved for one thing, never to help themselves. <laughs> and part of that list is, um, men of almost every degree of wit called on me in the migrating season. Some who had more wits than they knew what to do with. Runaway slaves with plantation manners who listened from time to time like the fox in the fable, as if they heard the hounds obeying on their track and looked at me beseechingly as much as to say, oh, Christian, will you send me back? So, oh, Christian, will you send me back is part of uh, like, an uh, abolitionist poem, right? Like the, the slave is saying, oh, Christian, will you send me back? The runaway slave. Um, and then he says, one real runaway, runaway slave among the rest, whom I hope to forward towards the North Star. The people down here are, are like, um, these principles themselves are, are tyrannizing. They're like, they have more ideas than they know what to do with it. Um, and um, um, this border represents like getting away from that. Get away from that, from that principle, from that idea that's tyrannizing. Okay, I see that the next class is coming in. I'm out of time. Um, so I will see you next week. Thank you.